Yeah, our memory verse, Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Those who sow with tears will reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro, weeping, carrying his bag of seed, will indeed. Let's look at that. Psalm 126. Will indeed come again, carrying his sheaves with him with a shout of joy and this is a song of celebration after God brought back the captive ones from Zion as you read when we meditate on all that God has done for us you know this is Thanksgiving week in this country when we meditate on all that God has done for us, this will be our response. And it doesn't matter if um, you're still in a period of sowing and weeping, or if it's the season is a happier one. Let's read the whole psalm. When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter. It was almost too good to be true. That's what it was like a dream means. And our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. This is why God allows us to go through trials. So that others around us, unbelievers, those who are struggling in their own faith, will look at our lives and say, wow, God did something wonderful for him. God redeemed their marriage when it was on the rocks and all hope was gone. When everything seemed hopeless, God did a miracle. This is the God. This is the true God. This is what we must proclaim. You know, a lot of people are taken up with great miracles like demon, casting out demons or raising the dead. The reason that God used, did those things in Jesus' time and through the apostles was because he had to testify that Jesus was the true God. And in the name of Jesus, when somebody was raised from the dead, all these people who believed in other gods would say, yes, Jesus is the true God. Or when a demon was cast out in the name of Jesus, where nothing else worked, then you knew that was the true God. Today, in this country, most people are trying to cast out demons or raise people from the dead to make a name for themselves. It doesn't result in Jesus being exalted even more. And I believe that in such places where it is necessary for a demon to be cast out, which I believe is always necessary, or somebody to be raised from the dead, which may not always be necessary, or for somebody, somebody to be healed miraculously, which also may not be always necessary, God will decide if this will result in proving to the people there that Jesus is the true God. He knows the hearts of men. And he sees the motive behind the person who could cast out the demon. Is it because they want to get a name for themselves? Or put it on YouTube and say, uh, you know, brag about it? And God won't move in such cases. But where there is a need and where it will result in Jesus being lifted up higher and proven that he's the true God, he will still move. And I've seen him do that supernaturally. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Verse 3. Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Your day is coming, brother, sister, friend. Your day is coming. It may not even be on this earth. I don't want to leave you with a half promise or with an unfulfilled promise that God will answer every single one of your prayers on this earth. That may not be the case, but he will answer. He will fulfill his purpose at the end. I've got this picture recently. What would you like to be found doing when Jesus returns? I'll give you two options. Jesus is coming back soon. What would you like to be found doing when he returns? Do you want to be found planting a tree, sowing? Or do you want to be found napping under a tree that you planted some time ago? Let me get the picture again. When Jesus comes, do you want to be found planting? 
Or do you want to be found taking a nap under the tree that you planted some years ago that has now flourished? And everybody looks at you and think, wow, his tree is something, and he's napping. I tell you, I believe this with all my heart. It's a real picture the Lord's given me, and I'm, I'm meditating on that often throughout the day. Lord, I want to be found planting. Others may have things that they can show for, but I tell you, the one who is sleeping under a tree that God helped him plant and grow, and now is just taking it easy, under that tree that God allowed to be planted and allowed to grow, will be the loser in eternity, if he is in the presence of the Lord in eternity. And the one who is fulfilling this verse, he's still planting. And everybody says, man, you've been planting your whole life. Yep, I'm going to still plant. I'm looking for the fruit for the tree that will flourish in eternity. I'm looking for the tree that God will cause to grow there. Yes, we'll see growth here on this earth, but I'm not li li living for some, something that's only temporary. I'm not, I'm not looking to take a nap under a tree. The godliest men that I've read of and known are ones who to the day God called them home, the ones who are not alive anymore, they were planting. The greatest example of that is Paul himself. You read in Acts chapter 28. You know what Acts 28 ends with? It's not some fanciful Paul had a retirement home and he, people uh, you know, came and met him and he... You rode off into the sunset, <laughs> like a lot of people, like a lot of movies. There's no riding off into the sunset for me, or at least for the wholehearted disciple of Jesus. There is a, I'm laboring, I'm planting, and I'm planting with more vigor when I'm 60 years old than when I was 20. That's the life that Jesus promised. Like I've said in this church often, pedal to the metal, accelerator on its way up, not on cruise control. That's what I want in my personal life. That's what I want in my marriage. That's what I want for my children. That's what I want in this church. I believe that's what the Lord wants. That we're charging the gates of heaven. Not slipping in slowly. Where the angels look at us and say, Oh wow, you made it too, huh? Kind of barely slipped in. There may be some who will make it that way. I don't know. It's not the life I want. I want to be zooming into the gates of heaven whenever the Lord calls me home. That's what, think of Zoom when you think of Zoom. <laughs> we use Zoom a lot. Zooming into the gates of heaven, yeah. And I hope that picture helps you some. Because if you're in a season in life where you're planting and you look at others who are napping, it's another word that the Lord's been uh, uh, impressing on my heart recently is this word lowly. I read it again this week in Zephaniah chapter 3. I will leave among you a lowly people, a humble and a lowly people. The world doesn't understand this at all. But this is the secret of heaven. See, this picture I get in Psalm 126 verse 5 and 6 is of a man or a woman just with their head bound, bent down, lowly. Their head is on the ground. Where shall I plant now, Lord? Where is, I'm not looking up. Who's looking at me? Who's watching I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not glorying in what the Lord has planted through me. My head is down. Lord, where should I plant? I'm a lowly person. Lowly. Pick that spot in your marriage, dear husband. You'll have a wonderful marriage. Pick that spot, that lowly spot in your marriage, wife. You'll have a wonderful marriage. Pick that spot in your home, parents. It will go well with your children because you've picked a lowly place. Even with our children. And in the church, pick a lowly place. Don't seek for the prominent ministries. And I'll tell you, I'm in the greatest danger of that. Us elders who get up and speak. If any of you get up and speak. It's harder for us to be lowly because we have a ministry that God's called us to do. But we must still labor. I believe that. But we labor in lowliness. Thinking of ourselves as nothing. I see, I sometimes hear about different churches or my, somebody might share a message from some other church with me and I, I look at what's going on in Christendom. Not to judge them, please understand. But I want to know where is Jesus in the midst of all of this? Is he in that church? Is he in the other church? Is he in, the, in that church or that YouTube preacher or that other channel? Where is Jesus? He's with the lowly. And it doesn't matter if things get shut down for us, which I believe they will at some point. We might lose this building. We might lose our ability to broadcast. But we can't, they can't take Jesus from us. If we're lowly, he'll be here. See, the sad reality is not that, that, you know, they say in this country they've got God out of the 
schools and God out of churches. No, that's not the sad reality. The problem is Jesus himself has left some churches. He's standing outside the door and knocking and saying, behold, I stand at the door of your church and knock. The government didn't kick me out. I left. Why? Because you weren't a lowly people. You weren't people that were excited with me and taken up with me more than who's there or who's coming and who's going, what friends are in this church and what friends are not, or uh, you know how many followers we have and subscribers and, and all this nonsense that goes on in Christendom today. Don't fall for that, family. Don't fall for that. Jesus is the most precious thing to have. And if we have him, we have everything. They can take everything else away from us, even our physical Bibles, which they will one day. That's why we want to teach our children to memorize God's word. I've read stories of men and women who were locked up in jail cells and they were thankful for the three or four memory verse, verses they'd memorized because that's what kept them going. When it says God's word, you, man shall not live by bread alone but by uh, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God <clears throat> and you know that there's a shortage of food coming. See, people panic nowadays that they just hoard up toilet paper and things like that. <laughs> Why not hoard up God's word? Because there's a famine of God's word coming. That's why it's good that our children do this. And it's not to show off or, or you know, like we often say, even if they just read it. They make an effort to hide God's word in your heart. The only way, dear brother, dear sister, dear children, that you can be free from sin, avoid sin, is if you have hidden God's word in your heart. That's all the way in the Old Testament. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. It's a, I, I was convicted there, families, listening to the children. Every single one, almost all of them got up here. There's uh, 20 or so. We spend a good 10 or 15 minutes every Sunday listening to them say their memory verses. And I hope that we're not going to miss the blessing that we're telling, giving them, us adults. Oh, the children did their memory verses. That's great. What about us? Let's become like little children and, and take our memory verses seriously. I, I'm convicted. I'm not speaking to anyone but myself here. I want to know God's word more and to have it in my heart. God will help you. You don't need mental ability. You don't need to be a scientist. You don't need to be like Einstein. Look at our children. They stumble through it, but they do it. And I'm absolutely convinced that these times of sowing that they do through the week and up here, they will one day come bringing their sheaves of God's word. And God will use the, the, the grain, that they, the seeds that they planted and use them as ministers of God's word. Men and women, boys and girls who will know God's word, who will be set free from sin because they made, took the effort to hide God's word in their heart. And children, remember that. More than even in your mind, hide God's word in your heart. Do it. If you find that memorization doesn't come easily, don't be discouraged. Don't condemn yourself. Try it. I believe that a, a passage into our heart is the mind. And the more you try, not even succeed, the more you try to hide God's word in your mind, it will go into your heart because you'll spend time with it and you'll value it more than anything else. Obey it. So I want to be found sowing when Jesus Christ comes, planting. God will cause the growth. The theme of the Bible, as I think about it, is this essentially that God has never failed anyone who trusted him. God has never failed anyone who trusted in him. That's the theme of the Bible, you can say. And Jesus came to prove that, that we have a Father who loves us. And no matter how horrible it is, no matter how messed up your life is, and I look at a couple of examples today, that no matter how hopeless the situation seems, what you read, if you make it to the end of the Bible, is God came through. There's an old gospel song I learned when I was in college, when I used to sing in the gospel choir, was this, He never failed me yet. And the song goes through different circumstances, telling of different stories in the Bible. And the chorus goes, oh, he never failed me yet. And that, I, I still can remember, picture myself standing up there with a the choir, tears streaming down my face as I sang that. And I look back on, um, songs tend to make me cry sometimes. <laughs> Maybe they do for you too. But um, I would sing that and I would reflect on, because college was, was a hard time for me at times. And uh, I would be going through something, but then I'd remember, man, I remember two years ago, I thought everything was going to the dogs, and I thought it was, that's it, it's over now. And here I am, two years later. He never failed me yet. And my dear brother, dear sister, I, I have a burden to speak a word of encouragement and hope to you today 
that if you think that somehow God is going to fail you this time, that's the lie of the devil. He never failed you yet. He's never failed anyone that's trusted him. That's why you must read the Bible and know. Faith is to believe that God has never failed me yet and will never fail me yet. That's the Santosh version of it. God will not fail me. I'm more convinced of it today the more I've walked with him. And you may be going through something in your life that's shaking you. This week was Thanksgiving week. I want you to see a verse in Hebrews chapter 12. Why should we give thanks? Why should we give thanks? There's a lot of reasons why we should give thanks. We give thanks for his faithfulness. We th give thanks for his goodness. But all of those things are Old Testament reasons to give thanks. Old Covenant reasons to give thanks. Outward things. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry, religious or irreligious, will say, well, I guess if they're atheists, they don't say this. But anyone who thinks there's a God will say, thank you, Lord, for your blessings in my life. Thank you for your many blessings. You've given me food to eat. You've given me a home. You've given me clothing. Yeah, those are great. But those are still outward things. Those are still an old covenant experience that causes us to give thanks. And here, when we come to the new covenant, read Hebrews chapter 12, where he contrasts Sinai with Zion. Sinai pictures the old covenant. Zion pictures the new covenant. And as part of that contrast between Sinai and Zion, between the old covenant and the new covenant, we read this, verse 28, the end of that. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us give thanks. Let us show gratitude. I want to ask you, dear family, those of you who are living in the new covenant, who believe in the new covenant, and say, yes, I'm in the new covenant. When's the last time you gave thanks for the fact that you've been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken? I'm convicted myself as I think about it. Lord, have I stopped to give you thanks for the fact that the kingdom you've given me is an unshakable one? The United States kingdom, it can be shaken. Doesn't matter how much you trust in it. The, um, uh, your, the kingdom of your job, that can be shaken. The kingdom of your health with all your healthy eating and exercise and all that, that too can be shaken. The kingdom of your marriage, the kingdom of your home, you might think things look stable, but it can be shaken. But God has given us, brothers and sisters, God has given us in the new covenant an unshakable kingdom. Let's give thanks by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. God has given us an unshakable kingdom. He will fulfill the promises of, that he has given us in this kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, we read in Romans chapter 14. So, the righteousness that God wants to give you is an unshakable righteousness. Not a righteousness where if everybody's looking, you're righteous, but when they're not, yeah, you delve back down into filthy habits. The righteousness that God has given you is a steady, one that's going up, not up and down and up and down and up and down. It's an unshakable righteousness. God has given you unshakable peace. This is the kingdom of heaven. Unshakable peace. That means no matter what you face, no matter what doctor's report you get, no matter how bleak the outlook looks, your peace cannot be shaken. Unshakable peace. Unshakable joy. They can steal your money. They can steal your job. They can steal your reputation. But they can't steal your joy because it's an unshakable joy. This is the life. Lord, you mean that no matter what happens, no matter what happens with the economy and with COVID-19 and all this other stuff, I can still have joy. I can still have peace. I can still have righteousness. Oh, I want to give thanks. Because they, David didn't have this. Abraham didn't have this. They, um, Job didn't have this. Noah didn't have this. Elijah didn't have this. Jeremiah didn't have this. The greatest of them, John the Baptist, didn't have this. But you have it. Give thanks, brother, sister, because you have the opportunity for unshakable righteousness, unshakable joy, unshakable peace. See, the pattern of the Israelites when they went through the wilderness, if you turn with me to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible. You know, it's interesting, the book of Deuteronomy is perhaps one of the least read books in the, in the Bible, I would think. 
uh, because it just has a long name and it's got a lot of chapters and maybe, you know, you don't understand it. <laughs> I used to dread, I, you know, I often, I'll tell you a little bit as an aside, I often, as a child, I can't remember when I started, maybe seven, eight years old, trying to read through the Bible. It's a good, good exercise. I encourage you to do it if you can. But don't give up if you, if you don't make it because I never did until I was an adult, <laughs> honestly. I never made it through the Bible, at least, you know, chronologically. Despite trying and starting over every January 1st, almost every January 1st, I'd start over. I usually would give up once I got to Leviticus because I didn't understand it. And if I made it to Deuteronomy, that was about it. But you know that, the, the, that in the temptation in, in the wilderness in Matthew 4, there's one book that Jesus quoted from, and that's the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> he didn't quote for the devil from any other book, Deuteronomy. Just as an aside, if you didn't know that. But the pattern that you see about the Israelites was this, that 10 times they faced a problem, 10 times they complained about that problem. Oh, Lord, you brought us out here just to die. And 10 times the thing that they were afraid of happening didn't happen. 10 times God met their need. You see this pattern? 10 times they faced a problem. Ten times, every one of those ten times, they complain, Oh, Lord, why again? You, you're just going to leave me here. Yeah, you've done these wonderful things so far, but ah, this time you're not going to come through. Even the tenth time, even the tenth time, you would think by the tenth time they would get it. They would look back and say, Wow, Lord, it's been nine other times. Yo, you got to come through for, for us this time. I know you will. Now, they should have learned it the first time because God had already done some wonderful miracles in bringing them out of the land of Egypt. And by the way, I'm not talking about the 10 plagues. These are 10 other things that God did for them in the wilderness. I mean, I would think, and I don't want to be so presumptuous as to think that I wouldn't be like them. In the middle of telling us about the Israelites in 1 Corinthians 10, God gives us this warning. Let him who thinks he will not be like the Israelites take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, I think. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. If I think, yeah, if I was in the Israelites' shoes, I would have had faith. You probably wouldn't have. I probably wouldn't have. I'll be honest. But having seen the waters parted, having seen God put the plagues on the Egyptians and save me from it, you would think I would trust him now. And yet as I look back on my life and I think, Lord, I get into those circumstances and all of a sudden my default reaction is panic, is unbelief. And God's been faithful far more than 10 times, hasn't he? 10 times God allowed the Israelites to face a problem. 10 times the thing, 10 times they complained. And they said, oh, Lord. they complained at Moses, complained at God, complained at everything. And every one of those times, the thing that they were afraid of happening, we're going to die in the wilderness. We're not going to have water to drink. We're going to starve. We can't eat meat. The thing that they were afraid of didn't happen. And God met all of their needs. And then we read here in Deuteronomy 6, verse 23. See, Deuteronomy is a repetition of the law of God. And in a sense, it's a reminder that God is giving the people of Israel through Moses. And this is, I believe, given at the end of the 40 years. Moses is about to die. At the end of this book, he dies. And it's a reflection. And God is now speaking to the second generation. He moved on past the parents because he saw, he said 10 times, nah, I can't work with you parents anymore. I'm going to work with the children. Now, that's not a message of condemnation for us parents. It means be like a child, have faith today. God is looking for those who will have faith. And he says, okay, you who didn't want to believe, despite all the things that I did, I'm going to move on past you. He allowed them all to die. Everybody that was, I think, 20 years and older died in the wilderness. And then the younger generation, 40 years later, is now their adults. They're middle-aged people, and God has to tell them. They're at the border of, of uh, Canaan. 38 years earlier, they stood at the border of Canaan, and they could have gone in. 38 years later, now they're coming in again, and now God is telling them, listen, don't be like your fathers who were here 38 years ago, and they had unbelief, and they didn't go in. And they said, after, I know God's done all this for us, but this time, no, he can't do it. The giants are too big. The problem is bigger than what I faced so far. I'm going to just give up. And God said, fine, okay, not for you then. And God tells them, the children now, the next generation, which is a picture, those who will have faith, those who will trust the Lord. Verse 23, Deuteronomy 6, verse 23. 
he brought us out from there in order to bring us in. He brought us out from the land of Egypt to bring us into the land of Canaan, to the promised land, to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. Our fathers missed it. He swore to them, but he's going to give it to you. He brought us out to bring us in. See, if you turn back to the previous book, the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 13, this is the incident that I just referenced 38 years before these words in Deuteronomy 6. It was still true that God had brought out their fathers from the land of Egypt to bring them in. The promise was not, if you read it carefully in the book of Exodus, when Moses came to the leaders of, e of the Israelites, was not, hey, I'm going to take you out, but your children will get to go in. That's not the promise. The promise was, I'm going to take you out and you will go into the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. And here we read in Numbers 13 that they came to this land after two years of walking, two years of God, like I said, ten times they faced a problem, ten times the thing they were afraid of didn't happen, and all ten times God met their needs. And here they are, two years of walking and trusting the Lord. Now they're facing, as it were, this final test. I think, you know what's sad? I think there will be a lot of people in, in eternity, maybe in heaven, but certainly in hell, who will look back on their lives and say, man, all I had to do was trust him one more time. It was like that last miracle that God was going to do for me and I was going to enter into that land I, and I gave up at the last moment. Don't quit before the miracle happens. Don't quit before God answers that prayer. And I'm not talking about earthly things. God may do that. But I'm talking about the spiritual land of promise. Don't give up. That next step you take may be the step that gives you the promise that God wants you to have. Don't give up now. Trust Him. Because here was a group of people whom God had faithfully led up to this point, And they gave up at the last minute. What do you think? Um... Um, Hoshe, no, um, Shama, verse 4. Numbers 13, verse 4. See, God, uh, they had picked out one leader from every tribe of Israel. There were 12 tribes, so they sent out 12, 12 spies. We know about Joshua and Caleb. Caleb was from the tribe of Judah, and Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. We read in verses 6 and 8. Eight, and from the ten other tribes, there were other leaders. Their names are ones you're not familiar with. Shamua, we read in verse four, from the tribe of Reuben. Uh, Shaphat, from the time of Sim, from the tribe of Simeon, etc., etc. What do you think Shaphat and Shamua, for example, are thinking right now? I don't see any reason why they're not in hell today. I'm not here to say where they are, but I know that they're looking back. These were ones who didn't make it into the land of promise. Joshua and Caleb did. But these other 10 didn't. What do you think they're thinking today? It's like, man. They're looking back. History records a few chapters later that Joshua and Caleb did go into the land of Canaan and did defeat every single one of those giants. And everywhere that their foot trod, God gave it to them exactly like he promised. And here's Shama and Shaphat and um, all these other ones. Egal. Thinking, man, I gave up. He had led me faithfully for two years and I gave up when it mattered most. Don't be like that. Don't give up. So we read in verse 27, when they returned, they said, we went into the land where you sent us and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. God was right. He didn't lie. Their eyes even confirmed that what God had said about the land of promise was true. It does flow with milk and honey. Not only do we have God's word to tell us that the promised land, which is the new covenant life, the kingdom, which I just talked about, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, God says it's yours, and it's an unshakable kingdom. That's God's word. Not only that, we all have tasted of it to some extent. We've seen it. We've seen the example of godly men and women. We've read of godly men and women who put the principles of the new covenant into practice, and it worked. That's like the spies coming back and telling the others, hey, there is milk and honey. It's for real. I've never seen a land flowing with milk and honey. But apparently this did. 
And that ought to have been enough for these others who said, really? Milk and honey for real? I've never seen in my whole life. This is nothing compared to the leeks and the melons that we had in Egypt. This is flowing with milk and honey. Okay, I still feel a little bit of doubt, but you know what? If God said it was milk and honey and here these people have confirmed it, I'm just going to believe it, move forward. Oh, how different the story would have been for them. It surely is, certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. They brought back fruit to prove it. Nevertheless, verse 28, Numbers 13, verse 28, the people who live in it, the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. They saw the promise of God, but they also saw these other giants, which, listen, God had allowed those giants to be there just to test the faith of the Israelites. You see God's promise, and you see the lust in your flesh. You see the promised land. You see the land flowing with milk and honey. You see the possibility of an unshakable peace and an unshakable joy and an unshakable righteousness. But you see the lust in your flesh that prevent you from getting there. What will you look at, brother, sister, child? Look at God's promise. Verse 30. Then there was a man named Caleb who said, listen. He quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. Verse 31, But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. Etc. Verse chapter 14, verse 1. Then the all the congregation lifted up their voice. Verse 2: the sons of Israel grumbled again. This was the eleventh time, as it were. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones, verse 3, are, will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Listen, they've come two years' journey to the edge. I mean, they can see across the border the land of Canaan, and they want to go back to Egypt. There are Christians who've done that, who've come to the edge of a life of victory, of a life of peace, of the promised life in Christ, and said, no, nope, this last trial I'm facing is too much. I'm just going to go back to living like the rest of the world. I'm just going to go back and give it all up. You know that the number of people, I think it says here, the number of people, well, certainly it was only Joshua and Caleb. The number of people who wanted to turn back and who missed out on the promise was much greater. Joshua and Caleb were two out of probably a couple million people. You know, you think about being in the minority. This is not one percent. This is one in a million <laughs> Are you willing to take the one in a million chance that God is right because he said so and because you've tasted of it and you've seen the example and the proof of God's promises in the lives of others? Are you willing to take that one in a million chance? Then you will be like Joshua and Caleb. God's not going to let you down. He didn't bring you this far to leave you here. That's a message of comfort I want to leave with you this morning. Um, you think of Abraham. Genesis chapter 13 God gave Abraham a promise, and Abraham walked with God. When God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees, he was um, 75 years old, if I remember correctly. And God said back then, I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing to many. 75-year-old Abraham, and I'm going to make you the father of a multitude. Do you know that it was 25 years before God answered that prayer? 25 years. I don't think any of us has had to wait for something for 25 years. And yet Abraham did. Now he, made, he went through some detours. He got distracted a little bit along the way with Ishmael and with other things. And he got distracted. But he made it to the end. Every time he messed up, he said, Okay, God, you wouldn't bring me this far to leave me. Here. And I want to show you one specific example. We read in Genesis chapter 19, actually. Genesis, 9, Genesis, Genesis 20. Abraham had trusted God. Remember when in chapter 15, I think, when Lot wanted to grab his nephew, 
who's younger than him, wanted to grab everything. And Abraham said, sure, go ahead. And God took care of Abraham. God, Abraham trusted God. I, I, I don't know how old Abraham was, maybe 80, 85. Ten years of trusting God and, Ab and his, his nephew Lot wants to grab. How audacious of him to do that. His nephew. And how unbelievable that the older Abraham should allow his young upstart nephew to pick first. And of course, Lot grabbed and said, Aha, you fool, Abraham. I'm going to take the best. Who's the fool now? What did Abraham say the next day? See, it says God visited Abraham after this. What do you think was going through Abraham's mind? Lord, you didn't bring me this far to leave me here. You'll take care of me. Let Lot grab. Let God choose. Let Lot choose. I'm not going to grab because I'm trusting in you. You didn't call me out from there to leave me homeless. You didn't do all these wonderful things for me all these years just to leave me. Oh, oops, Lot chose first. So now, Abraham, sorry, I can't fulfill the promise for you. No, that's not how it works. God will fulfill his promise despite the grabbers, despite those who take advantage of you, despite those who steal from you. Because he's God and nothing can stop his hand. And then we read that Abraham, he made a mess with Ishmael. And then he had to reap the consequences of that. Still no sign of Abraham. He's 20, still, still no sign of Isaac. Chapter 20, he's 100 years old. 25 years. And I am sure, it's not recorded, but I'm sure that Abraham too had some doubts. He's like, because ah. I'm sure there were people who told him, Abraham, what are you doing, man? 25 years, you've just been wandering. Where is this father of the multitude business? You don't even have one. That Ishmael also, you told me, is not really the one that he's talking about. After 25 years, if you don't have one, and God has promised you a multitude, you're probably sowing in the wrong garden. I think that's what people probably told him. And Abraham had those doubts, because I have those doubts. Lord, am I doing it right? Am I in the right place? Should, should I be, still be doing this? I'm following your word. I'm, I'm honoring you. I'm seeking your kingdom first. But I don't see sign of the fruit yet. And Abraham, God was testing him. Then he gets to chapter 20 and he does one of the worst things he's done in his life. He puts his wife into a horrible, sinful situation. I've never heard of another man ever doing that. You know, even the worldly people talk about chivalry. You protect your wife. You over my dead body mentality. And here's Abraham, the little coward, saying, over her dead body, you'll get to me. Putting his wife in the forefront, coward that he was. This is the man God had still promised would fulfill, uh, he would fulfill the promise to. And cowardly Abraham. Abraham sends his wife, because he's afraid of his own uh, skin, of his, his own skin, so to protect himself, he puts his wife in harm's way. And she's locked up there in Pharaoh's palace. He's going to take advantage of her. But God was watching. <laughs> and when Abraham couldn't pray, his wife prayed. We read in 1 Peter 3. Abraham was, I don't know what he was doing that night. But Sarah was crying out to God. And she cried. Said, Lord, you gave us this promise. I'm crying on behalf of our marriage. My husband is out there in unbelief, you know, in, the, in discouragement or whatever. And I'm locked up in the palace and I don't know who to turn to. But you, I hope in you. That's the verse we read in 1 Peter 3 verse 8. Who hoped in God like Sarah did. And God heard her prayer and moved in ungodly Pharaoh's heart. You and I have never faced authority like Pharaoh. You know, today we, we worry about the authorities and the power that they have over us and the churches and the restrictions and all that. First of all, the first century Christians had Nero. And no, <laughs> no presidential candidate, no earthly authority comes close to what Nero was like. Then you think about Pharaoh. Think about Sarah. In Pharaoh's palace, she's there all by herself, nobody to turn to. Talk about restrictions. And she hoped in God, says, God, I'm turning to you. You're my hope. You will turn the tide. And God moved, spoke to Pharaoh. You read that whole story in chapter 20. I don't have time to show you. But God spoke to the, the king, said, don't touch that. She's, not, she's a married woman. Don't touch her. He said, okay. And he didn't. And Sarah was preserved and you know, reunited with Abraham. And then Abraham prayed to God and healed Pharaoh. And it says their children, their family, their, the Egyptians were healed. You read in Genesis 20, verse 18, or verse 17, that Abraham prayed to God. 
You know, there's a verse that's not in our Bibles, which I like to think of. It's Genesis 20, verse 19. If you have a Bible, look at it. I hope it's not in any of your Bibles. It's the verse that comes between Genesis 20, verse 18, and chapter 21, verse 1. In chapter 21, verse 1, we're going to read that God answered Sarah's prayer. It's not even in the King James, right? Right, okay. Just making sure. Um, um, it says, chapter 21, verse 1, begins with this. Then the Lord took note of Sarah. Here comes Isaac, after 25 years of waiting. And what's Genesis 20, verse 19? It's not written because you have to fill it in, dear friend, dear brother, dear sister. I know what my Genesis 20, verse 19 looks like. Abraham and Sarah are walking back riding on a camel, I assume. It's a lonely journey. Sarah doesn't want to be anywhere near Abraham, I'm quite sure of it. She's like, you, you got me in this mess, I'm keeping my distance, I need some time to heal after what you did to me. And there's Abraham, he's probably in the back. I don't know where he is, but he's sitting and, and all these thoughts are going through his mind. 25 years, Lord, you've been working with me, you've been patient with me. I can't believe I messed it all up. I blew it, there's no hope for me now. Surely, surely my sin has to be the be-all and end-all of the promise. It's got to end with my sin, right? And then you get to chapter 21, verse 1. It's a long journey from Egypt back to the land of promise. It took the Israelites two years. I don't know how long it took Abraham. A few days at least. And for those days, God allowed Abraham, allowed him to maybe wallow in some depression, discouragement, hopelessness. And then I believe, it says in Romans 4, we read about how Abraham believed in hope against hope. Hope against hope. He didn't regard his body as worth anything, old as it was, we read Romans 4. Hope against hope. He came to the place where I believe, if I could put words into Abraham's mouth, he didn't bring me this far to leave me here. He didn't bring me this far. See, God knew that Abraham was going to sin that way. And this was the second time Abraham did this. God knew the mess that Abraham was going to make of his life. God knew everything before he even gave Abraham the promise. My dear friend, I hope you'll remember this, that God promised you the new covenant, a life of unshakable righteousness, a life of unshakable peace, a life of unshakable joy, long before you even sinned and made a mess of your life. He promised it for you, your name on it, knowing that you would blow it. And now having blown it, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, well, I blew it, too much for me. He didn't bring you this far to leave you here. He didn't bring Abraham this far to leave him there. Verse 20, 21, verse 1, Then the Lord took note of Sarah as, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Oh, read that verse. I go back and read Genesis 21, verse 1 often. Even if I don't open my Bible, I remind myself of it. Then God took note and said, as he had said, and God did as he had promised. Say that over and over again. It's a good memory verse to memorize if you're looking for one. Then the Lord took note as he had said, and the Lord did as he had promised. Remember that whenever you face that next trial that's coming your way this week or this month. Abraham believed and received the promise. About 15 or 20 years later, God tests him again. Chapter 22. God, now Isaac is a grown-up son. He's 15, 18 years old. And uh, God says, listen, Abraham, I want to prove that you still love me, that I'm still first in your life. Here you are, 115, 118 years old. I fulfilled the promise. Your son that I promised is the son of promise. He's 18 years old or so. And now, listen, I still want... To know that even now, even now, you're still willing to trust me. And so he's he says, listen, I want you to take Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him to me. And don't just do it in your backyard because that's, okay, spur of the moment decision. No, you got to walk for three days to this mountain far away, Mount Moriah. He wants you to walk. What do you think those three days were like? I don't think Abraham slept even a wink. All day he's walking alone. His son is right there. And his son is, is looking at Abraham's furrowed brow and thinking, what's wrong? We're just going to go 
sacrifice to the Lord. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Abraham, I've seen you. Dad, I've seen you do it many times before. We take the turtle doves or we take the ram or whatever. We sacrifice and it's wonderful and God's presence is there. We're just going to do that again, right? On Mount Moriah. And Abraham's like, son, I can't tell you. I'm sorry. I can't. I have to keep this from you too. Because you're the sacrifice. He didn't say that. He walks and he walks and he walks. One foot at a time. One foot at a time. What do you think kept Abraham's feet going? He didn't bring me this far to leave me. He didn't give me this son of promise just to take him away from me. No. God's got something. I, I don't see it. I don't know. I mean, we know. We, we read the end of Genesis chapter 22. And these things are written for our instruction so that you, when you're in Genesis chapter 22 verse 1, walking through your Moriah experience, you will fast forward and say, Lord, I see the example of godly Abraham. I see the example of godly Noah. I see the example of Jesus most of all. My foremost example. And I look back on all you've done in my life. He never failed me yet. He's never failed me yet. And he will not. He didn't bring me this far to leave me here. He didn't bring me out of Egypt just to leave me to rot in the wilderness. He's going to take me into the land of promise. This wonderful verse at the end of, uh, of this experience, Genesis 22, verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. He didn't bring me this far to leave me. He will provide. What need are you facing today? Especially spiritual needs. Is there a battle you're in, dear brother, dear sister? A battle in your marriage? A battle in your home with one of your children, perhaps? Raising your children? Um, a battle with, another, with a relative, your parents or parents-in-law. Uh, what is the battle you're facing? You're on this side of the land of Canaan. Perhaps you can see the promised land on the other side. You're tasting of it, but you're not experiencing it fully yet. Move forward in faith. He didn't bring you this far, whatever he's taken you through, having saved you. He didn't save you from sin to leave you rotting in sin, defeated by sin. He didn't forgive your sins just to leave you defeated by it. Remember that. We're in this battle against our lust. We're in, in this battle to, to live in victory over sin. He didn't bring us out of living in sin to continue to be de defeated by it. I want to leave you with one more example. Um, in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I don't know what um, I, th I want to imagine or, or, or speculate a little bit here, but I think it's off the Lord, what it was like for the disciples and those followers of Jesus at that time when Jesus died. You know, it's easy for us to think, oh yeah, he rose from the dead and we celebrate, uh, all the Christendom celebrates Good Friday and Easter and all this stuff. We know that the tomb is no longer empty. But what was it like? I often like to put myself into those circumstances because that's where my faith gets strengthened. What was it like for Peter and for Mary Magdalene especially? I want you to think of. And these weren't, Peter was, I don't know, 30 years old or so. Mary Magdalene's probably about the same age. Young woman, young man. What was it like for them? So Peter was one who had, who had deserted Jesus. He had uh, sworn and, and renounced Jesus with oaths, it says. Mary Magdalene was a woman who was saved from seven demons. I've seen a few demon-possessed people. I've seen demons cast out just two or three times in my life when I was a child. I can't imagine what a, a person with seven demons inside of them would be like. And God, Jesus removed those demons completely, cast them out. And what do you think was going through Mary Magdalene's mind as she goes on Sunday morning in chapter 20, verse 1? On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, while it was still dark, what was going through her mind? She, I think she thought it's over. She thought it's over. Yeah, I know you saved me from the seven demons, but I didn't think it would end like this. With a tomb and the body of the man who set me free there. I just want to show my gratitude to his dead body even. That's how much she was grateful for it. The dashed hopes that are represented between John 19 verse 42 and John 20 verse 1. I love these in-between verses. The dashed hopes that are represented there. 
in Mary Magdalene? What about Peter? I made a mess. I said, I swore too that I would be the one that would defend you. Let everybody else run away, but I'm not going to. And he was the first. And for the next few days, three days, he's been beating himself up. Beating himself up. It's like, man. I'm sure some of the other disciples taunted him. Oh, Peter, you're the one, right? You said, I'm going to get victory over sin. Aha. There's a psalm which talks about when the enemies say aha over you, God wants to give you victory. And so, you know the rest of the story. Mary Magdalene comes and she sees Jesus, the resurrected one. Peter sees Jesus. Peter tell, Jesus tells Mary Magdalene, go and find my disciples and Peter. He mentions him by name, the one who's beating himself up, the one who thinks there's no hope for me. Pull him to, call him to. I have a plan for his life. I have a plan for your life, Mary Magdalene. I'm going to use you. I didn't bring you this far to leave you outside a tomb. I didn't bring you this far to leave you with unfulfilled hopes. So what is it you're trusting today? You're trusting the Lord for today. Jesus told the parable of a widow, in Luke chapter 18, who went back to the judge day after day, night after night. Give me justice. Give me justice. And if you've been walking with the Lord and trusting him for something, some spiritual, maybe the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you find that there's just a dryness in your life. Yes, you're walking with the Lord. Yes, your sins are forgiven. Yes, your marriage is in pretty good shape. Yes, your children are in pretty good shape. They're growing up well. But you lack the power of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of God is not in your life. There's something missing in your Christian life. And you've been asking, and you've been asking, and you've been asking. Don't give up. He didn't bring you this far. He didn't give you the promise of the new covenant, the promise of the Holy Spirit to leave you without it. He didn't give you the promise of a new covenant, spirit-filled marriage to leave you without it. He didn't give you the promise of spirit-filled children and a spirit-filled home to leave you without it. Go back to him and ask him until you receive it and you will know when those rivers of living water are flowing out of you. Unshakable righteousness unshakable joy, unshakable peace. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. He brought you out to take you into the land of promise. He will do it. Amen.